Welcome to the Strap and Link Podcast, where we cover brands from their inception to their latest release. It's the Montrose Two. Like I said, better movement, spring drive so potentially, Rolex Oyster Perpetual. Out of there, super ocean, super ocean here. Now you see this kind of renaissance of two. Finally, in 2016, they achieved the spring drive with an eight-day power. Run. The podcast for watch lovers by watch lovers. New episodes every first and third Monday <sighs> of the month. Welcome back to the Strap and Link Podcast. Oh. Your <laughs> other host is incapacitated <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back, everyone. Hello. Hello. Is that how we're starting? Audible? Yeah, might as well run it. All right. All right. We're start. All right. Well, we've got a. F- we've we've scratched the funny bone here. Um, we found some jokes. So we mean it'll good. be a very easy to edit episode, or we might just let it run with all the mess ups. Whatever oh, you man. guys prefer. It's gonna be yeah. It's gonna be brutal. Hello. <sighs> Welcome back to Strap and Link, everyone. If this is your first time listening, you're probably wondering why you're still listening. If this is not your first time listening, welcome back into the show. We hope that everyone has had a great week end since today is Monday. Yeah, and uh, if, take if this is your second time listening, you're probably like, okay, these guys are much less professional when they're not interviewing somebody. And that is very true. Yeah, so pretty much. The true opinions of the show will come out. Now. Yes. That's pretty much what happened. Uh, we are back just together, the two of us, David and I. No guest this episode, so yeah, things are going to be off the rails from from here on out. But we do have a very special episode because we are talking about one of the Holy Trinity in Audemars BK, which we're very excited to do. We have not done a really like high horology brand yet. You know, I mean, we've done Rolex. That's as and close JLC. as we've gotten. I'd say JLC's the up JLC, there. Yeah. Well, I think from pricing, you know, I'm thinking yeah. like the Vacherons, the Audemars, the Patex. Uh, yeah, those Richard are Mills, the big three. You know? that so, are yeah, so we, haven't, so we haven't scratched those yet. And this is our first venture into it. So it's going to be fun. The history section is uh, pretty <laughs> jam packed. And um, yeah, I don't know. What did you think about researching it? I, I, have some opinions on the brand after doing some research, but what, uh, do you find anything spicy before we get um, into it? I mean, really, I think what shocked me and you both was the, I don't want to say lack of inventory, but you know, the, there's really yeah. two different collections on this watch company. You know, I mean, Rolex known for their, um, their Submariners, their GMTs, but they have 12 different types of watches that they make or, you know, different collections that they make. Yeah. And it was pretty surprising <clears throat> that, uh, you know, AP's really got the Royal Oak and their few variations. And then the, uh, code 1159, um, which of course in all of these collections, there's tons of different variations of the watch. But, you know, it was kind of surprising, kind of narrowed things down for me and Brad, I think, when we yeah. uh, when we were doing some research on what watches to talk about, because we were just pretty much arguing back <laughs> and forth, like, do we just do all Royal Oaks? There's really not much more to pick from, but I think, yeah. you know, we decided to do two Royal Oaks and uh, two Code 59s, or 1159, so um, it'll be a good episode, kind of good variation, and I mean, some watches you might not have heard about, and uh, yeah. you might fall in love with. Yeah, that's exactly right. We just talked last night about it and tried to kind of hone in and really figure out, you know, which Royal Oaks were we going to talk about? How many were we going to talk about? Because that was, yeah, to echo David, that was exactly what happened going through research. We just kind of found out that the Royal Oak is um, as synonymous with Audemars as it can possibly be to the point that, yeah, like David said, they're you can kind of get lost in the number of Royal Oak references, but if you were to ever venture outside of that, I think you might be a little bit surprised, but that's kind of why our show exists. So we're going to give you two Royal Oaks that we're going to go into detail on when we're thinking about things like the specs of those watches, but we will talk about a lot of Royal Oak models just sort of at large. But today on the show, we are going to be covering the Royal Oak uh, flying Turbion, as well as the Royal Oak Jumbo Ultra Thin. And then the two Code 1159 watches are going to be the Perpetual Calendar, as well as the Self-Winding Chronograph. So we're going to talk about those. Um, our history is going to go all the way back to 1875, and then we'll uh, kind of finish off with some Royal Oak history and some of the big achievements there. Um, before we do that, anything... Anything else you've got to add 
to the show today or any other thoughts that you have from I'm ready research to or jump anything? right into it. I think I'm ready. Jump right in. You know, okay. let's, it's, it's going to be a lot of history and we're ready to tell you and mispronunciate all these words for you. So yeah. buckle in guys for another great episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of uh, French and Swiss words on this one, but before we jump into the history, don't forget, give us a follow on Instagram at strap and link as well as on TikTok and YouTube. We have new YouTube shorts. Instagram and TikTok and YouTube are kind of popping these days. So Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of new followers, talked to some folks, met some new people. So yeah, give us a follow and you'll get to see mine and David's lovely faces accompanied with some uh, pictures of our own personal watches and yeah, all kinds of goodies. And also the watch battle resumes tonight, today, this episode, Yeah, because we did a part two episode on our last one, actually our last two right uh the last two episodes have been part twos with long jeans and grand seiko that's where we kind of skip the history we've already done it we just go and talk about four new watches that we didn't talk about on the very first episode and as a result we have decided to not do a watch battle so to speak and if you're new to the show what that basically means is that we always pick four watches to talk about on each of these episodes and at a certain point david and i talked and decided that we wanted to split up those two. The first two are going to be watches that we are picking for ourselves. And David, last night, how did you phrase it? You said so one keep, watch. I mean, all of all of these uh, watches that we'll talk about. You know, you'll have a few listeners that are very cynical when it comes to monetary monetary value you know they're saying hey we you know i'd rather uh, maybe i like to look at that watch better but this watch is worth five times more so i'm gonna go with that one you know and then i can sell it and uh so to kind of take that out our watch battles will be for now on imagine you get a free watch but you can never get rid of it the value of it has no meaning to you it's just for the love of the wear and you have to keep it for the rest of your life so uh when you start voting on these you know just Think of something that would add to your collection and be a great fit for you personally, or just saying, hey, if I could have one of these two watches just based on looks alone, which one do I like? And that's kind of how these battles are going to go. Exactly. Looks, complications, uh, medals and colors and all kinds of things. So yeah, very much personal preference. We kind of got to that topic because David had a flying turby on Royal Oak (laughs) uh, on the ballot today, and I had had just the stainless steel jumbo. Yep. And I was like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I wanted to bring it up like, well, you know, some, you know, people that are well educated, like most of our listeners are when it comes to the price on everything, they are going to know that your watch is like 150 grand and mine's like 35. So, um, yeah, we just want to kind of nix that out. So, yeah, your personal preference, like what appeals to you? Is it the movement? Yeah. The watch? Is it a skeletonized dial? Is it a precious metal of some kind? So. Those are the two watches that we're going to do up front. Those also do happen to be, for this episode, a pair of Royal Oaks, like we said, the Flying Turbion, as well as the Jumbo Ultra Thin, um, before we get into the Code 1159. And with that, do you want to go ahead and jump into some Audemars history? Let's hit it. I found that Audemars PK lean very heavily into their roots via their website. So when you go to the history aspect of a lot of these websites, they go into where they're founded, when, who, and all of that good stuff. Audemars are one of the first, if not the only brand so far that we've seen that, I mean, almost all, I'm not going to say all, but a lot of their content is really, really focused on where. And so they they have a quote that says, in the heart of the Valet Valley de Joux, I'm sure that we're mispronouncing that, the Valley de Joux, a region that beats to the tune of complicated watch mechanisms that everything started for Audemars Piquet in 1875. Yeah. And then, uh, so Jules Louis Audemar and Edward Auguste Piguet, two young and ambitious watchmakers, established their first workshop in 19, I'm sorry, in 1875 in Le Brassus. By leaning on the power of the Valet de Joux network, they began crafting complicated mechanisms by hand. Audemars was focused more on the technical and product side, while Piquet was focused on the sales and business. While the two entrepreneurs produced first complicated movements that they sold to Geneva-based companies, they eventually began the production of complete watches by finding skilled craftsmen throughout their local region. 
Yeah, and so buying in blanks, cases, dials, bracelets, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then sending those bracelets out for gem setting and for decorating. The AP ledgers note that roughly 80% of the 1,600 watches they produced between 1882 and 1892 included at least one, if not several, complications. So these are oftentimes going to be refined chiming, chronograph, and astronomical watches, which were assembled and finished by hand in the first workshops in the Valley de Joux. Uh, later in 1892, AP created the first minute repeater watch, which was the reference 0389. For those that may not know, a minute repeater chimes, which indicates the hours, the quarter hours, and then minutes. Those chimes all together will then tell you the current time based, of course, solely on sound. Then in 1899, the first grand complication pocket watch was created by AP. This featured a minute repeater, an alarm, a perpetual calendar, a deadbeat seconds, chronograph, and split seconds hand. So funny to note the deadbeat seconds complication. Uh, it's also sometimes referred to as a jump seconds. This requires the second hand to tick once per second, just like a standard quartz watch would, while offering absolutely no added benefit. So I... I saw this deadbeat seconds. I had to look it up. I didn't know immediately what it was. Literally came to find out that it is a, uh, it is a mechanism that requires, it, it's a complication that requires its own, you know, mechanical, uh, you know, operating system to then beat the seconds hand once per second to slow it down, to make it look cheaper without giving you <laughs> anything in return. <clears throat> Very funny complication. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, so in the early 1900s, Audemars and Piquet both passed away in 1919, but the brand was led by the next generation with sons Paul Louis Audemars and Paul Edward Piquet. Funny enough, they have the same name. <laughs> in 1921, they created the first jump hour wristwatch, and in 1946, they created the world's thinnest watch at just 1.64 millimeters, which is quite impressive considering Richard Mill actually just created a 1.75 five millimeter thin watch, which is named the UP01 Ferrari in 2022. So even thinner back then. The first RMR Piquet perpetual calendar wristwatch reference number 5516 was released in 1957 and uh, would probably be worth a lot of money today uh, for comparison. The first Patek perpetual calendar, which was built much later in 1981, sold in 2013 for $1.7 million. Crazy. So uh, if you can get your hands on the uh, first AP one, then you'll uh, you should have a good payday coming your way. But until 1950, they employed about only 10 to 30 craftspeople, and the, the number grew to about 100 with the birth of the Royal Oak in the 1970s. And since then, they've, been, they've seen a lot of development in several buildings and manufacturing sites in La Bresse's Le Lacla, which, as many of you are longtime listeners know, we talked about in Tiso, and is actually, I believe, the birthplace of Zenith as well, and then in Mayrent. Yeah, Tissot with the Tissot the Lacla <laughs> wristwatch. So in the late 1960s, early 1970s, things obviously changed for Audemars with the birth of the Royal Oak, which is the reference number 5402. And nearly every article that I came across mentioned the quartz crisis being a certain force that made traditional watchmakers, especially ones like AP, rethink what a watch should be. So I don't know if sales were down or if companies were just straight up acting out of fear, but this again was in every single bit of research that I found mentioned the quartz crisis and the rise of, you know, cheaper, uh, sort of more sustainable watches. And this of course had a lot to do with the initiate with the initiative to create this new luxury steel sports watches, how Audemars referred to it. Yeah, and the 1960s also witnessed a shift just in general towards sporty, more versatile timepieces with steel becoming so much more popular just due to its durability for everyday wear. Because remember, at this time, most watches were not in this category or, you know, as I you know just said in the 60s was when watches became more geared towards that. Before this, everything was really built to be a dress watch, right? I mean, in the in the 50s is when we really saw the first you know, divers take over the market with the release of the Rolex Submariner and some other divers, of course, but 50 Fathoms by Blockpan. But um, 
in terms of, you know, just outside of those, right, everything was really geared towards these rose gold, maybe not so much rose, but definitely yellow gold and white gold dress watches. And so this was, you know, sort of, I think all combining, you just saw the shift in what people wanted and what people kind of needed, you know, just based on the times changing. I mean, this was also probably a time when, you know, people go into baseball games in America were wearing a suit and a tie, right? Like with a jacket. Yeah. on. So you're sort of coming like out of that era into what would eventually become, you know, the sort of the kind of the golden age of these steel sports watches when, you know, watches like the uh, Speedmaster Professional, for example, were launched up into space. And so all of this is sort of playing in the background. And, you know, when we're talking about this luxury steel sports watch, of course, nothing other than the Royal Oak exemplifies that better. But the reference 5402, which was introduced in 1972, was really designed in the late 1960s by Gerald Genta. So many of you might know the story, but for those that don't, the so Genta was contacted by Audemars Piguet in April, the night before the Swiss watch show, which later uh, went on to be known as Baselworld, to design a luxury sports model. And so he did. And they showcased the design. A few years later, in 1972, the watch was finally released. It had an octagonal bezel, which was said to draw inspiration from vintage divers helmets. Uh, if you've ever seen like the huge, you know, sort of uh, like back in Scooby-Doo, you know, I remember there was always like a, you know, back in cartoons, you would always see these types of things, right? Uh, the eight screws on the bezel as well being octagonal in design. And this was sort of Audemars answer to this shifting world of steel sports models. Um, and a fun fact, that watch would be sold in today's dollars for 30900 for comparison, the Rolex Submariner would only cost sixteen hundred dollars U.S. from its original sale cost of one hundred and fifty U.S. in the nineteen fifties. The Patek Philippe Nautilus, which released a few years later in nineteen seventy six, that one would cost sixteen thousand five hundred USD. Hmm. Uh, so the Royal Oak was a very expensive, very very expensive watch. In between nineteen seventy seven and nineteen eighty one, more than twenty seven new calibers of the Royal Oak were born, both for men and women, powered by seven different calibers, with the first quartz model arriving in 1980. So they eventually did answer the quartz question. We had a question about this last week on our episode with Joe Kirk and Grant Seiko about quartz models. Uh, Raymond, you and I have DM'd on Instagram. I found out that's a 33 millimeter that they're still offering today. Nothing higher, so I was a little bit disappointed. Um, in 1983, though, when the when most Royal Oaks had eventually grown to 36 millimeters in diameter, the first model for the complication made its debut, which was the date eight reference 5572. That was soon followed by the Royal Oak triple calendar. And then finally, the first open worked model debuted in 1986. This was a yellow gold watch with a perpetual calendar that, in, that introduced the first Sapphire case back to the Royal Oak lineup. Yeah, and in 1993, the Royal Oak Offshore and its 42 millimeter case arrived. Designed by Emmanuel Geit, it incorporated several innovations. The lugs were now curved, a black seal was revealed under the bezel, and the crown and pushers were clad in rubber. This was aimed at a young crowd and new trends. You got to remember, quartz watches with funky designs and odd branding wasn't uncommon at this time. Audemar Piguet was mindful of its female audience as well, with the Royal Oak Mini coming in at 20 millimeters in diameter in 1997. The woman's collection had already been enriched with open worked watches for a few years now, it's culminating in 1998 with the Royal Oak Open Work, a white gold case, bracelet, and hand set with 446 diamonds. Just a few. <laughs> the uh, 25th anniversary of the Royal Oak saw three new additions to the complications range. First, the Turbion, a 39 millimeter chronograph, and the first grand complication in a 44 millimeter case. AP defines a grand complication watch as one that must include a minute repeater, split second hand chronograph, a perpetual calendar. This is based on the tradition of the three families, timing, chiming, and calendars. In 2012, the Jumbo 15202 unveiled a blue dial that was faithful to the 1972 with its petite tapestry pattern and AP monogram at the 6 o'clock. 
In 2016, Carolina Bucci was invited by AP in a celebration of his 40-year anniversary. The Italian-born designer reinterpreted the Florentine technique of gold hammering that gives a frosty, shimmering look to the royal oak frosted gold. In 2018, it is marked by the revival of the bimetallic jumbo variants not seen since the 1980s at the time. The same year, the Royal Oak Self-Winding Perpetual Calendar Ultra Thin became the thinnest automatic perpetual calendar wristwatch of its time. Yeah, and in 1995, so this is post-Royal Oak, a little bit of updates since then. Uh, But in 1995, AP created the world's first automatic grand complication wristwatch. And then in 2006, the first ever direct impulse escapement, which requires no lubrication. So a lot of (laughs) Royal Oak talk there. A lot of models, a lot of updates. Um, The Royal Oak Mini, 20 millimeters. Yeah. That is when I when I saw small. that for the first time, I was like, "Dang, that is very tiny." Like, yep. I don't even have a reference point for a watch that small. I mean, that. Yeah, I like, mean, I, I, I'm <laughs> trying to think the smallest watch I've seen is a 24 lately. So, I mean, yeah. 24. I mean, even even and that. That's I mean, like I've a heard... Rolex Datejust <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or an man. OP. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. Um, yeah. I saw a. Uh, um, watch dealer friend of mine just showed a King Midas Rolex Cellini, which is mm-hmm. a very small, funky kind of art deco looking, uh, sort of anyway, design. And it's really tiny like that too. And I was kind of yeah. like zooming in on it and I was like, man, this like, how do you even set this? You know, <laughs> I was like, I'm like my doubt that my fingers could like, you know, maneuver the crown and pull it out, you know, and everything. It just, mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, I people guess were a lot smaller back then. Smaller fingers, I guess. Back then. <laughs> I the guess women, so. petite. Yeah, yeah kind of jumping, uh, jumping onto the first watch. Let's just jump right into the Royal Oaks. I'm sure that's what most guys and girls came here to listen about and hear a little bit more. So, the first Royal Oak I want to talk about is the uh, Royal Oak Self Winding Flying Turbion. So just a little bit of history on the Turbion. Um, Again, I'm not a scholar on this stuff, but uh, just for people that maybe don't know anything about what even a Turbion is, um, it was created by Abraham Louis Breguet in 1795 and patented, I believe, in 1801. Um, So Turbions are really used um, to balance the imperfections of its statements. Okay. So during the chronometer trials of the 19th century, you needed really a Turbion to keep up and stay with all the rest of the watches at the time. So there was a big influx and request of all these handmade turbions to be added to their watches. And uh, actually in 2009, they re- redid these chronometer trials for the uh, 150th anniversary of it. So kind of a cool little tidbit there. But again, turbions cool. balance the imperfections of escapement. Um, the rotator, instead of rotating on an escapement wheel as a normal movement would do, a normal automatic movement would do, the tourbillon rotates a tourbillon cage and everything within it. So under the cage, there is actually a static gear which meshes to the escapement wheel to take away that um, imperfection and moves it as it makes it look like it's moving as normal, but it's actually moving much smoother and there's much less lack of plus or minus uh, time loss within your watch, which is why in the chronometer trials, the only way to really keep up and keep the time was to have one of these in their watches. And this movement actually really happens once every minute. It makes a full rotation. So your tourbillon wheel could actually be used as a double up as a second uh, hand as well. And uh, you hear the term flying tourbillon again in this watch. So a flying tourbillon is just have to do with the shafts. So on a nor- normal tourbillon, there's actually two shafts that are attached to the tourbillon wheel. And w- for the flying, you take one of those away and it actually opens up the view of the tourbillon wheel mm. to a uh, to a watch. So you can kind of see inside of it. And I mean, in my opinion, if you're paying for a $100,000, $150,000 watch, you'd like to see the movement a little bit more. So the flying tourbillons have really taken off in popular. That's kind of what we are going to talk about here. The uh, Flying Turbion, which again was re released in new models in 2022 by uh, Audemars Piguet. 
This is a 41 millimeter in pink gold, which if you hear us say pink gold, just think rose gold is their version of that. Um, white gold, stainless steel, and titanium. So you can actually get this watch in really anything you would want with a case thickness of 10.6 millimeters and a water resistance of 50 meters, which again, you'll notice a lot of Royal Oaks. I mean, I think they're all really 50 meters in water resistance. There's no big water resistance here that you would think about in some other sport watches. Um, their caliber movement is the caliber 2950, which is their 27 joule self-winding movement. It beats at three hertz and 21,600 vibrations per hour and has a power reserve of 65 hours. And a lot of these flying tourbillons, I believe there's a couple that are actually limited editions, depending on the dial that you want. They have a dial and they have an open work dial, which is a full skeleton dial, a navy, a black, a sunburst, blue and a black dial. There's a few of these like the sunburst dial that are actually uh, limited editions. So I'm not even sure if they're still available on the market, but all of these watches on their website are price on request. So very popular. If you just want to go all out and get a, uh, a heck of a <laughs> Royal Oak that everybody knows, I mean, the flying tourbillon is definitely the way to go in my opinion. If I could just say, hey, if I could have any Royal Oak, that I will want it would be the flying tourbillon. And these are I wanted to check. I wanted to check. These are running currently for a cool two hundred and ninety one thousand dollars according depending, to watch analytics.io. I mean, yeah, you know. Hey. So that's the that's the sunburst <laughs> blue dial that you yep. have um highlighted on the left. So that's a pretty penny. I'm I'm curious, so was it uh the was it like the mechanical aspect and the sort of ingenuity aspect so, or just a little bit of the uniqueness? Like, like what draws you to a tourbillon? Cause it's a, it's I mean, a different the dial and design. It's yeah. The open work, which I think I'm starting to notice a pattern. Are you just, are you kind of getting more into open work? I'm definitely getting more into open work. I used to okay. be anti <laughs> skeleton okay. look. Um, and I'm still not really loving a full skeleton watch, a full open work watch, but I like something like this where, you know, it's, it's the perfect, I think, mix of, Hey, very noticeable because everybody knows what a Royal Oak is. Plus it has that flair of the open work and you can really see the mechanics inside of it. Um, again, yeah. like you said, a lot of these, especially the limited editions are around 300,000. Um, you can get a couple of the, you know, more basic, uh, flying tourbillons. I mean, still you're looking at. 180,000. So you're still all over 200,000. I mean, they're very expensive, but they, they come with a flair that if you're looking for a flying tourbillon, I mean, there's what's better than a Royal Oak and getting a flying tourbillon at the same time. Cause a lot of these flying tourbillons you'll notice are on a lot more dressy watches. So actually yeah. being able to have one on a uh, Royal Oak, something a little more sporty is definitely attractive. Yeah. You know, I want to bring that actually up for a second. So <clears throat> I was watching a video over the weekend, just doing some research on the Royal Oak. And I found that the watch I'm going to talk about the jumbo, which I don't know if the tourbillon has, well, let me actually just back up since I'm not an expert on how tourbillon movements work. I don't even know if this component would even be there, but that the jumbo ultra thin doesn't have a balance bridge on the movement that it's not actually really even built for sport that, you know, that's a, that's a core component that, mm -hmm. you know, that has to do with shock resistance. Right. And so you yeah. think about a sports watch and if you're, you know, going to market it that way. So, um, I'm not trying to nitpick or anything, but I'm, I'm curious, like, um, maybe not curious, but it's just, it's a little bit peculiar that this is, you know, we sort of think synonymously of steel sports watches and the, the big two, which is this one, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak in some fashion or the Patek mm -hmm. Philippe Nautilus in some fashion. But the more that I've looked into the AP Royal Oak, it really is like, I mean, it's kind of just like a dress watch in metal almost because they don't really build yeah. from my experience and researching and what I do know about watches. They just don't really build them that way. You know, yeah, um, I mean, the it, movements case, are definitely, yeah, they're not protected near, I mean, but how many are when you think yeah. of, when you look at a lot of movements, I mean, the Submariner's movement is still so rudimentary when it comes to, you know, complications like a Royal Oak or like a JLC watch and some of their sporty editions. Um, I definitely and, think, I mean, that's what the Turbion comes in and really kind of does is it, yeah. it, it evens out. You got to think about a, a, 
car, like a, one of those toy cars that you wind up and shoot is always wanting to move forward. And an escapement is supposed to make it want to move forward and backwards and tick like a watch. And when you're having that tick, you're always going to naturally is not going to be precise. You're always going to have minute loss. And that's what these come in and try to protect against. So yeah, I mean, maybe your basic, your basic Artem RPKs don't, but I think if you step up and really care about that, there, there are options here by AP. It's just going to cost you a prettier penny than maybe most other watch brands. Yeah. Yeah. And cause I'm not saying that, you know, that this watch is like not sporty enough. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's fun, I guess, to see that AP are putting a movement like that into what they classify as a sports watch. So not that this particular model with the Turbion movement um, is not kind of built up to spec, but just a, just kind of a thought that I had just kind of in general about the Royal Oak lineup. Um, yeah, before we jump in, I just want to go ahead and throw out the uh, very long reference number for uh, <laughs> for the Royal Oak uh, Flying Turbion, just so people have it. Their uh, main reference number here with their navy blue with a little bit sunburst dial is the 26730ST001320ST.02. And so they, all of their flying turbions will have, will have the majority of that will be the exact same, but the, the ending number of the .01, .02, um, .06, those will really differentiate between um, which different flying turbion you want. So uh, if you want to just keep that in mind, um, I think all of AP's watches are really like that too. Same thing with the Jumbo. They're all majority of the same uh, reference number just at the very end. That's where they do their differentiation. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. Cause yeah. So like the jumbo, for example, that's the reference 16202. Um, but then after that it changes, you know, depending on the, you know, does it have diamonds? Is it steel? Is it gold, you know, yeah. color dial, so on and so forth. But the jumbo, yeah. 16202. I wanted to clarify because we get, cause this is your watch battle. Mm-hmm. You're taking this up against me in a poll. Which one are you taking specifically? I'm gonna because it can only be one. You can't take yeah. all the turbion. You I'll, already I'll taken the turbion. You. Just to recap it, you are taking a stainless steel Royal Oak flying turbion with a blue dial. So the blue with a navy blue dial sunburst look. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I just had to know what I was going up against, you know, because mm-hmm. the second watch that we're going to be talking about is also a Royal Oak, but I had to go a different route because David took one of the more complicated Royal Oaks away from me. And Ooh. he tried to take all the money too with Ooh. his flashy with his flashy pants watch movement, his fancy pants turbion. So I am coming in with the Royal Oak Jumbo Ultra Thin. I'm going Ooh. OG original, <laughs> except <laughs> I'm going rose gold model. Right. But, See, and I'm I'm torn on that too for the one I know we just said I'm going stainless steel. I'm t- torn on the rose gold model of the flying turbion too, and I could change my mind, but because they the rose gold looks so good, doesn't it? The rose Uh, gold looks amazing. And the reason that I, so initially I had the stainless steel, but after I saw the cost of what these turbions are going for, I thought, okay, well, yeah, so it was, it was a little bit of that. I I wanted to, I wanted to give people, you know, the option to have sort of these two, because let's be honest, these are like the grail of the grail, yeah, right? To get a Royal Oak jumbo at 35 grand in in stainless steel that's the grail watch right yeah to get the rose gold one at 78 whatever it is retail that's that's like next level right yeah never getting that so it's gonna be on the aftermarket so it was a little bit of that let's give people kind of two upper echelons of the grail Mm -hmm. category but honestly the other side of it was you know the way that we framed this uh you know you could have one watch from the brand for the rest of your life but you you have to take the money and the, and all of that and the investment out of it. If I can only have one Royal Oak, I definitely want it to be a jumbo. I want yeah. it to be a, a heritage paying tribute watch, right? To yeah. the, to the original. So I'm always going to be jumbo. But then when you get into that jumbo catalog, you have the original one with the blue dial, and then you have some other colors black and white and things like that but you get into this rose gold and there's something about i think a gold royal oak that is like this is a 1972 watch designed in the late 60s i don't know if there's more 70s kind of uh aesthetic than like a gold sports watch i mean that's pretty badass so that's kind of why i chose to go that route but to give you all some quick specs 
like I said, this one is based, uh, you know, on the on the original 5402 reference from 1972, the famous A series with the AP logo at six, the written Audemars Piquet logo at the 12 o'clock with no seconds hand. This is a 39 millimeter, just like the original, again, in rose gold for this model with a case thickness of 8.1 millimeters and a water resistance of 50 meters. <laughs> so that's kind of what I was bringing up on your tourbillon. Again, I was not talking about the tourbillon, but just the Royal Oak in general. Um, yeah. it's just, a, it's just a wee bit ironic that, um, it is again, kind of the poster boy, or at least yeah. one of the two poster boys for the quote unquote stainless steel sports watch category, but it really doesn't do much for the sportsman. Yeah. Um, has the caliber yeah. 71, 21 automatic movement, which beats at four Hertz, 28, uh, 1,800 vibrations per hour has a power reserve of 52 hours. And again, on this rose gold jumbo model cost is going to be 78,300 USD. That is at retail. I did want to just let everyone know, uh, very quickly what your cost and figures would look like in the real world. So again, the stainless steel jumbo, the one that, it, you know, if, if, if most of us are going to be getting one from retail, it's going to be that one, 35 grand retail currently trades at 78.3 K according to watch analytics.io. So, um, just a little bit of context and perspective there. And like I said, I chose this because it is ultimately the most iconic watch in my own personal opinion of the Royal Oak family. Um, you know, I base that off of the fact that we love to hype, not only just you know, our own preferences and like how we steer the watch market at large when it comes to aesthetics, but also the price speaks for itself. We mm -hmm. love to hype watches like the Black Bay 58, like the GMT Master Pepsi. Yeah. Uh, the Black Bay 58 and the GMT Master, obviously when we're talking about markets and aftermarket, we're, we're, you know, it's two different discussions, right? But the idea that those watches represent their own lineage of that brand, and that is what is so important to us seemingly as watch collectors. When a new watch comes out, that Tudor is like, oh, this is based on the reference from the Tudor Submariner that was released in the year 1954. We all, we all get, like, we all freak out about it. Yeah. Like, I didn't want a 39 millimeter diver of the same watch that was already out in, uh, or I'm sorry, 38 mil that was already out in a 39 the year before that. I didn't need that, but yeah. I'm going to freak out anyway, right? <laughs> so why would you, in the same vein, not look at the Royal Oak, again, just one man's opinion, look at the Royal Oak and say, the Jumbo, that's where it's at. That's the one that pays the heritage and the homage to 1972 and Gerald Genta. And so in this case, the only thing that I changed, of course, is the material going with rose gold for the sake of this sort of in-depth discussion and watch battle and kind of fun poll thing that we've got going on. Um, but otherwise, represents a Royal Oak lineage to a T. Does yeah, not I mean, have all the bells perfect. and whistles like David's Turbion, but at the end of the day, this is the watch that defined the steel sports watch genre. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty cool. What do you think about rose gold over steel on this type of a watch? That's where I'm so torn. Honestly, I wish there, I wish there was like a yellow gold, <laughs> but I know, I, I've yeah. just, I've never been a huge fan of white gold. Um, if we were doing this watch battle and they had a white gold, just that looks just like stainless steel. Sure. I would do it just to do it. But I'm like, I always feel like white gold is just a, I don't want to say a waste of money, but you know, I mean, if you want a gold watch, get something where people know it's a gold watch. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it just kind of doesn't have, uh, it's, it's weird, you know, because it's like, yeah, you were, you were, what you just said with it, my, your watch doesn't have all the bells and whistle, but this rose gold makes it look more expensive than even the stainless steel one that I have. Cause my bells and whistles are all inner inner case mm -hmm. so you see a little skeleton dial but there's really not much it's not flashing like i could have done a freaking grand uh you know grand, yeah uh, complication and then we really have a talk where ours are so different yeah but uh you know i think i think it's the perfect mix of most people are not buying ap watches to be a sporty watch they're buying ap watches right. to be their staple watches and if you're wearing an ap you're wearing an ap with a suit probably you're wearing an ap whenever the heck you're going out yeah nice and this would be, I mean, your watch, a, a rose gold tourbillon, a rose, which is why I might go back to that for the vote, but a Ooh. rose gold, uh, you know, jumbo or rose gold grand complication, any of these, it really, it really, I think matches the vibe that most people that have APs or buy APs today are going for, which is the nicer watches, the dressier watches. They're not wearing this watch out to the ballpark. 
you know, this is not a sporty watch. This is not something to go watch your kid play high school baseball. In. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I think, I think it's a good, uh, complicate or compliment to, uh, you know, the rose gold look to one of these watches. Cause it, like I said, it just finds that happy medium. Did you just talk yourself into changing your tourbillon to rose gold? <sighs> looking at yours, just get, is, just get I, I, rose gold? To, I think looking at yours, talk me into it. <laughs> it's it's well, and particularly with the black dial, there's the, the blue dial is what I first looked at and I thought, okay, you know, that's got the dial that was on the OG, but there, um, I don't know. I, I like, a I think rose gold and black a lot more than yellow gold and black. Mm -hmm. uh, my personal preference. But you can't go wrong either one of those two. If you you know if you prefer blue to yeah. that, it complements it so well. And you know what's funny about the AP Royal Oak is like the to go back to that same sort of talk track with the sports model, or I'm sorry, with the sports watch, but they're not really giving you like sports specs. You know what's so funny is that that watch is probably a watch that we love to say you can dress it up and you can dress it down more than anything, and yeah. it's probably true. But I don't think it has anything to do with what the watch is made of, how it's made and constructed, what it's built, what it looks no. like. It's the fact that, like you just said, it's a Royal Oak. Yeah. And that's a staple. That's a statement piece. And it's a staple in your collection and one that you're only getting rid of if you're like our age and you hit it big on Bitcoin <laughs> and then the market tanked. Yeah. Then then you're selling it. But if you're like a real person in the real world and you you sort yeah. of like earned your stripes and paid your dues to get your hands on this watch then you're never getting rid of it. No. And and so it's um yeah, to just kind of relate it back to to that earlier point, I I love that idea of the Royal Oak and that's honestly why I chose it because when you said, you know, you can wear it with a suit, you can wear it with whatever the hell you want, but then later you said, you know, you're not going to watch your son's baseball game. Like, hell, I'm wearing a white t-shirt and this <laughs> watch and jeans. And I'm loving every single minute of it because well, that, and that, when I said such that too, I thought about you can, it. Yeah, yeah. If you ha if you own this watch, you're probably wearing it to every damn place you go. <laughs> but you know, that was just kind of uh, making yeah. point. If you have a bunch of these, this would probably not be you know. If you have a bunch it, of Rolexes and stuff too, that. no, yeah, exactly, yeah, no. Yeah. I'm gonna wear a sub or my Tudor Black Bay or something like yeah. that to a baseball game, right? But most people that own but, this would be so proud of it, they'd wear it anywhere they could. <laughs> exactly, and and again, because of the status, the stature. The yep. silhouette, it's such a unique looking watch that you can wear it with like, honestly, like literally anything and people will recognize mm -hmm. it if that's what you're aiming for. But if, the, if you're not aiming for that, um, you know, I think people like watch people would watch people can see you wear this with anything and they're like, hell yeah. Yeah. You know, someone that's not into watches might see you wearing a white t-shirt and jeans and that watch and they might be like, you tool <laughs> you know yeah. but to us we're like hell yeah white t it looks great with anything you know it's it's sporty yeah. and it's fun and you, you wear it to the beach even though you probably shouldn't because it's yeah there's no screw down crown and it's only 50 meters of water resistant right so <laughs> you probably shouldn't but if you did it works so perfectly oh so yeah i think no matter what model you choose you're gonna get a good one um which is why this section was so hard we're like we're like we we shouldn't do four royal oaks we just shouldn't yeah. as a print as a point of principle, but it's so hard to narrow down because so much of their catalog, like we've already talked about, is that and you can talk for so long about the importance of these. Exactly. Yeah. And shifting gears away from Royal Oak, I mean, again, great watches. Um, you know, APs, I mean, I like the look of these. The code 1159 have really grown on me over the last, you know, couple weeks of doing research. Um, but I mean it's you know, I can't blame them and I don't want to bash this watch, you know, these type of watches because I mean, Patek, they, yeah, they do the same kind of thing. You know, they have a bunch of different watches that look good, good, very good dress watches, but they're not known for them, you know, so Audemars or Piguet is the same way. They're not, they know what makes their money. So why would they, they came out with these a few years back and, you know, they didn't get the the receptance that they really wanted. And so they really don't push them as much. They know what's still making their money. Everybody's going into an AP store and requesting one thing. Um, yeah. But, uh, but going back to the uh, code 1159. So 
this collection of watch was released at the SIHH convention in 2019. The Code 1159 collection is the latest addition to the Artemar PK lineup. The collection boasts several unique characteristics I want to tell you guys about. Um, all Code 1159 watches feature a chapter ring with numerals depicting seconds for all, for time-only models, a tactic time for the chronograph model, and a week indicator for the perpetual calendar. So keep that in mind. All of these kind of have their own little specific, uh, you know, niche to them. So the, uh, the watch again, I'm going to talk about today is going to be the perpetual calendar, which like I said, originally released in 2019. Um, the perpetual calendar has 18 karat white and pink gold at 41 millimeters. And this watch, honestly, I mean, I love the Royal Oak and everybody's, you know, if we weren't doing a voting, trying to win, this is a very underrated watch. Once I really dug cool. into this, it's a, it's a very cool watch. We'll uh, again, show pictures of it and I'm sure have it on clips for you guys to see. It has like a starry night background um to it you know it's like a deep navy blue to black a dial um and and into the dial has almost all these white specks that look like stars very cool again 18 karat white and pink gold on the bezels or case material um case thickness is 10.9 millimeters water resistance of 20 meters again none of the uh ap watches have great water resistance <laughs> um this watch beats at 2.7 hertz and has a very low power reserve. There's one big downfall of this watch, which is 40 hours. Um, kind of surprising. Um, I've noticed too, Brett, I don't know if you've really picked up on it, but all of their movements seem to be like mm -hmm. at three Hertz or less. <laughs> There's a yeah. lot of, yeah, it's kind of interesting to me. I was going to do a little bit more research on that because the, yeah, the last Royal Oak, uh, jumbo, um, caliber before the, the one that's in there now that mm -hmm. we just went over is at four Hertz. That one was also at like the 2.7 Hertz. It's like 19, like nine or like 17,900 vibrations. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not weird. even because you're used to seeing at least like 30,000 vibrations per hour. And yeah, I mean, so the, the, the Royal O Turbion three Hertz, but it's 21,000 vibrations per hour. And this yeah. is beating at 2.7 Hertz. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most watches, most watches definitely are, are three or four and, and there's really, I mean, yeah. it, you know, the higher does not mean like better, you know, it, it beats no. more frequently, literally. So it, the, the sweeping seconds will, will look, you know, let's, let's for descriptions purposes, it'll look more or less like a spring drive, literally, mm -hmm. you know, five Hertz, a high beat, 36,000 beats per minute. It's going to tick more frequently. So there's going to be less shutter in between ticks. I was going to say the last Royal Oak model used that the 2.7. Yeah. Did some research. I didn't really find at, at again at kind of first glance I, I didn't find much that supported kind of the why of it just that it was quirky people just yeah. kind of seemed to just accept that it was weird and odd and kind of moved on about it yeah so you know i think we're i think we're you know we're letting ap be ap and <laughs> kind of kind of the way to roll let them do what right? they want to, yeah exactly. exactly yeah but you know. the the big downfall of this watch to me was definitely the power reserve of 40 hours i mean this is not a watch you would wear every day so i mean and it's not one you want to set all the time no think I about mean, obviously you can have a watch winder but yeah could you yeah. imagine if you didn't which a lot of people we know don't i know i mean a, a, a th tough one to redo this is one you would have to leave on a winder i mean yeah if it's got a 40 hour i mean th like first off it's a it's a gold dress watch you can't wear that every single day no. so even if you're wearing it two or three times a week, you're going to have to wind it in between wears. I mean, shoot, even if you wear it five days a week to work every day, the weekend by Monday is going to be dead again. <laughs> I know. You it's, know it's, it's not even 48 hours where it's exactly two days or 47 no. hours. It's 40, so it's and well under two with, days. Yeah, and, and on top of that, the problem with power reserves is that there's always some variation, right? Like, yep, yep. you know, if, if it's not, I mean, in your example, five days a week, it's probably going to be fully wound, so you'll probably get the upper end of that, you know, maybe even like 41 or 42 and hours, that, but some of them will be 38 yeah. or 36 hours. So it's like my Monta Noble is like that. And that's what yeah. I hate about that watch is, yeah. is that the power it's, it's supposed to be, I think 40 or 42, but it doesn't get anywhere near that. It's like 34, 35, 36 hours when it's fully wound. And that's horrible because if you don't wear it back to back days, you get one day of wear. Yeah. And that's it. And, and, and we're talking about wound as in like actually manually winding it with your hand, not even, I mean, wearing it, if you don't, 
if you wear it every day, yes, it's going to be wound up, but what's best for the watch is to manually wind it. Mm. And that's what gets that 40 hour, you know, uh, it gives distance you your maximum, out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Gives you your maximum power reserve. If you're just wearing, if I'm wearing it every day and I don't wind it for a month, but I wear it, you know, every day for a month, it, it'll still be wound up good, but it's not going to be to the maximum power where it could last as maximum length as it would as if you wound it, you know, let's say on, I wore it five days a week and every Friday I wound it just, you know, 20 turns. Then yeah. that would, that would help out, help it out. But still, you know, it's a interesting feat. And a lot, another thing that I don't, Really, I don't mind the look of, but on their website, pretty much all of their uh, all of their perpetual calendars and really all of their code eleven fifty nines are are on a uh, are on a mesh bracelet, not a, not a NATO by any by yeah. any means, but but a mesh bracelet. You can look at some it's of their ladies, type. yeah. You can look at some of their ladies, and they're not, but I'd say ninety five percent of what they have is on some sort of a mesh bracelet, fabric bracelet. Which yeah. I mean, again, it looks good in the pictures but i just know me and my personal preference with bracelet or with a, i'm sorry bracelet like with straps like that like fabric yeah yep. but, well the uh, watch that you picked is not it's on a blue like alligator or some kind of a leather strap that's yeah, the and, one that i and wanted that's actually by the way that is not from their website that picture that i pulled is actually oh. from um Chrono. so this one does Come yeah on. so on their website oh, this one has a mesh uh, okay yeah so just keep that here i can add it to our Notes, yeah, because yeah. that got me excited. I mean, that was a that was a thing I noticed. But um, okay, yeah, I I see that picture now. It is that more is of that kind of a website. sporty yeah. sort of uh, fabric strap. That's yeah. really a shame because the one that you found with a leather strap, not that it you, looks know, you very can't good. just get a hundred dollar leather strap, but it's also like, come on. I mean, we're that literally we're paying, looks what, like forty the, grand the already. For this? Yeah, that looks like the crotch strap you bought the other day, or you yeah. have. The yeah, other, seriously. You I mean, the other day. this is one hundred six thousand dollars, and you don't give me the option, or at least no. you know, like, hey, here's well, fabric hey, and a crotch strap. But here's the positive: if you have eighty nine thousand dollars, you can go on Chrono and buy this exact rose gold, pink gold one for eighty nine thousand because these do not hold the values that oh, were do. they lose and value. you can get this croc <laughs> so, you, oh. yeah. so just heads up and I'm, i believe that's the same with brett with yours that you pick but the uh, of course the code 1159 do not hold the value that i was waiting for Roy this conversation do and i'm i'm sure we haven't done deep research but i'm sure the same thing was is with Patek. We can talk bad about uh, AP all we want when it comes to that. Sure. You know, Hey, the only thing people really want is the Royal Oak, but I bet you the same things with a lot of Patek Philippe's. They yeah. won't hold the value that a Nautilus would. The, I will say that as a watch, uh, you know, aficionado collector, whatever acronym that you want to throw there or title, whatever. Um, I am, f- am pretty familiar with the Patek Philippe Calatrava. Mm. And I can tell you that I had never before doing research ever heard of another Audemars PK, you know, like perpetual calendars, grand complications, annual calendars, think like, you know, those types of complications. Sure. And are some of them not on a Royal Oak? Sure. But to that point, yeah, they don't, the code 1159, that, that collection initially released and, and came out in 2019. Yeah. So it's a very new collection oh, yeah. of watches and it's hard to find, to gather, you know, in, in the, in the limited amount of time that we have, you know, having full-time jobs on the, on the, mm-hmm. on, on the side, right. Or like <laughs> yeah. this being our side project rather, you know, yeah. um, it, it is hard to get like all of the archives to see exactly what they were releasing and what they were offering year over year. But I just kind of have to imagine that, Based on the research that we've done and seeing figures like this, I mean, there is not a whole lot to AP outside of the Royal Oak. And I don't know if that's like blasphemy to say. I don't know if that's shitty to say, but no, no. I mean, their I think personality does it. not extend very far beyond the Royal Oak. Yeah. And that was, I was a little shocked to find that. I don't know if that's what we'll find on the Patek episode as well, but it's certainly the feeling that I had. You yeah, know, I think just definitely. when you see what all they do with the Royal Oak and historically what all that they have done. Again, you know, you, can you blame them for the fact of, hey, this is what we're going to sell no matter what. This no, is what we're going to get. No. So why do we want to throw a ton of money and time at something I don't else? Blame I mean, this again, these look like well-made watches. We're not saying they're low quality at all, but they just don't hold the value because it's, it's public. It's, I mean, it's economics. What it, what it 
what the suppliers want, what do people want. Yep. They want the Royal Oak. They don't they care as much about this. Royal Oak. Yeah, exactly. So the value is just not going to be there. I mean, it's, I mean the the same, pretty much the same movement that's in a date just or in an OP is in a sub, but the value of a sub aftermarket is so much higher. Just that's what the people want. I mean, it's not right. even the quality is that much better. It's the it's what the people want. Um, and I mean, Patek, they definitely have a few more collections, I believe. But I mean, okay, AP might be looking and be like, well, they're stupid. They're bleeding money <laughs> on collections that nobody wants to buy because everybody just wants the Nautilus. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. But yeah, so, I mean, you can't blame them for it wholeheartedly. But I mean, they're definitely one-sided on the Royal Oaks and hey, whatever works. They're they're not hurting for money. Um, no. Well, lastly, before we get to uh, Brett's final watch, I just want to just tell you guys what the uh, – what all the subdials were on the perpetual calendar, just so you know. Again, the center subdial is the month um, wheel. The right is the date. The left is the day. Um, so again, that's like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday on the left. The right is the number date. And uh, then the bottom six o'clock subdial is actually the full moon, the moon calendar. So, uh, but again, all of these subdials, they really don't even look like subdials until you're looking at the mm-hmm. actual lettering because they all blend into that night sky. Yep. So very cool. We will definitely post pictures of this. And and honestly, I I'll, I'll, will probably put a poll up or some sort of wheel up to just see what you guys think of this. You know, do you think this is a 10 out of 10, 7, 5 yeah. out of 10? What is your rating of this watch? Because I'm very intrigued to see what you guys say. Yeah, and we can do that too. I mean, I say let's even just throw another little kind of poll up um, for fun for my next watch which is yeah. the code 11.59 self-winding chronograph just to kind of get people's you know um perception of non-royal oak ap offerings yeah and right before i jump into the specs i wanted to just say really quickly i think that it's you know to your point i don't blame them for leaning so heavily into the royal oak and they've obviously done things with this 1159 collection although you do a little bit of research and you find that they have not done a whole lot with it they have not improved upon it a whole lot but that notwithstanding um definitely don't blame them uh totally in their wheelhouse with the royal oak and that like you said that's what people want i think just for the purposes of maybe the the format that we do our show i think it made it challenging i think the easy thing would have been to would have been to just pick four royal oaks and to just go into a hyper specific detail on those four and we could have done like you mm-hmm. know a grand complication then we could have done a tourbillon then we could have done the jumbo and then we could have done a chronograph right we could have done yeah. four distinct royal oaks and that would have been really easy yeah. but it's not what we've always wanted to do on the show so i think it did make it a little bit challenging to find two watches that were outside of the royal oak family that we also sort of connected to in some way um and you know got excited to talk about that being said you know worth remembering all of the things that AP have done over the years when it comes to their calibers and their complications. They kind of are that master of complications right up there with the likes of JLC, right? Mm -hmm. The, I mean, for example, the movement I talked about earlier that was previously in the jumbo, I'm forgetting the, the caliber number. I think it was the 2121 and this is now the 7121 that we're in. So Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe again the 2121 that was actually based off of a JLC movement from like the 70s. So yeah. they were using a movement that AP had sort of redefined and redone. But you know, in collaboration with JLC way back in the day, mm-hmm. just basically brought that movement to life. So it's like, yeah, no wonder that that thing, you know, is not very shock resistant. Like, no wonder that it's a little bit underwhelming and it's beating again at like two and a half or 2.7 hertz. So. I think what we should do, I think this would be really fun. Our next AP episode, about a year or so down the road, I think it'd be fun to do one on complications. I'm sorry, on on calibers. So we could do like two or three watch calibers that they have made over the years and go into like, you know, how long and all the different watches because that might be a little bit more fulfilling. So the Code 1159 uh, chronograph, this particular one that I'm looking at and kind of referencing has this sort of black kind of smoky charcoal dial. So it's not really gray. It's not quite black. Um, a little sort of hint of some maybe bronze in there. Yeah. Um, 30 meters of water resistance though. And the case material made of black ceramic with a 41 millimeter, um, case diameter. This caliber is the 4401 inside of this chronograph, which is a flyback chrono. 
which was the same as it was when this watch first released. The magic of a flyback function, for anyone that doesn't know, is the ability to instantaneously reset and then restart the chronograph all with one button. Mm. So yeah. instead of having the top button that starts and the bottom that stops and resets, the flyback will do all of that using one pusher. And yeah. so um, that initially uh, was designed and built in the 1930s, primarily designed for aviators. So fun fact there. Um, however, this watch beats at four hertz, unlike the funky ones that we've talked about in the past, 28,800 beats per hour, has a increased power reserve over your code 1159. Yeah, My watch has 70 so. hours. Yeah, this one has 70 hours of power reserve, nearly double. And for about half the cost, this one is $48,200 compared to the other one. Um, I'm, I'm doing some comparisons right now just to kind of give people, you know, some kind of yeah. frame of reference, because again, not a lot of people know about these watches couple of quick details that I found that were pretty interesting. So AP actually recruited someone by the name of Jan von, uh, von Kainel, a Dutchman from the sound of it, for the production of the dials on these. And he runs his own shop where he specializes in the stamping and the creation of such dials. The same, uh, the same techniques that are used to create and to stamp the AP Royal Oak dials. Von Kainel apparently is uh, pretty, pretty great at this. So AP recruited him. For that and the whole stamping process and and sort of coloring colorization afterwards um similar to what we talked about with joe kirk on grand seiko right yeah you you build a mold you have stamps but those stamps they have to be dyed and colored correctly there's there's hand finishing that goes on afterwards right um one other kind of i guess really the last bit about this from a construction aspect did you happen to look at like any of the videos or or some of the the angles of of this watch's case construction is so weird it's mm. it's a sandwich like construction so it's basically it's a bezel on top where you have a case back and then you have the octagonal case shaped in between and yeah. so the case sort of it it uh it has these this lug construction where the lugs are basically open work so it's kind of like a top bar and then a bottom bar that would connect mm -hmm. your lug where it's sort of drilled out in this in the center right and then that connects to the bezel and then it gently connects to the back on the case back and so it's it's pretty cool to see it's a unique looking shape and design it reminds me of, of like a richard mill from a aesthetics standpoint but um you know weird edges so it's it's unique for sure very unique. This watch kind of, to me, I mean, not very, I don't know, just when I see it, I think of this watch is very plain Jane. I um, mean, good chronograph AP. If you don't like the Royal Oak look and you want AP, here we go. It's a good plain Jane chronograph. It mm -hmm. reminds me of the Polaris from JLC. It's yeah. funny you brought up JLC um, because I was thinking as soon as I saw it, I'm like, this is kind of like the Polaris where it was like, hey, it's a plain Jane watch. But if you want a JLC and you're not into their, you know, Reverse popular those. stuff, this is what, this is what a good, just one. And I think we ended up having a couple listeners reach out to us and say, Hey, yeah, yeah Polaris is on order, <laughs> yeah. but this is, this is exactly what this watch, the chronograph, uh, the 1159 chronograph reminds me of is something along the Polaris. And I have the same exact, uh, views on the Polaris mm -hmm. as I do this watch, you know, good for, if you want something, you know, just a good chronograph that's very high quality um but if you want to drop forty eight thousand on it be my guest <laughs> yeah but hey, yeah. maybe you can get it after market for 35 yeah and and that i mean i don't think that that would be a bad deal right i mean yeah I, like i think that um yeah from the from a dial perspective yeah it's it's very minimalistic and plain jay and it's um you know it's not daring let's say but from the case construction i mean you are getting a case made of black ceramic and you do have a flyback function on this. So I don't recall off the top of my head if any of the chronos we talked about on our JLC episode had a flyback, but you do get that, which is pretty cool. Um, and I mean, like we said, like even compared to the other Code 1159 that we pulled out, that one, of course, having quite a different plethora of complications that it needs to support. But from the from a technical perspective, you know, yeah. again, you're getting nearly double 70 hours up from 40 hours. Um, for a little bit half the cost, we said, yeah, aftermarket, yeah, you could be looking, um, could be looking substantially cheaper. And yeah, from my, like the first watch that jumped out to me that kind of reminded me of this one is the Tag Heuer glass box, actually. Yeah. So, um, you know, just from, I think that sort of 
we, you know, you talked about the, what did you call the bezel? The, the chapter ring. You yeah. talked about the chapter ring on yours. They incorporate that again. That's kind of where the glass box nickname comes from is just, you know, it's a large piece of sapphire glass. You can kind of see it from all angles, so to speak, whatever. So kind of reminded me of that from that perspective, but yeah, the Polaris styling, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I see that a lot with the 12 numeral up at the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and just kind of, they're probably taking some cues from each other to very renowned caliber makers and watchmakers. But I do think that that case construction, like that's, that's one of the unique pieces to this. I think if you were to hold this in the metal and really see it and try it on, I think that's yeah. where this watch would like win somebody over, you know, I'm, I'm putting a different strap on it for sure. There's no way in hell a $48,000 strap <laughs> is going to sit on a fabric or I'm sorry, watch is going to sit on a fabric strap. Yeah. But I think you yeah, have to, uh, to own this watch is probably to love this watch. If I just had to guess from pictures, is it polarizing? No, you no. know, I'm sorry. We don't have rich friends enough to give us this watch that own this AP. But then again, we probably don't even know anyone that would, exactly. you know, it's, um, it's a different one, but such as the code 1159. So I think that was a great discussion on, you know, AP at large. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, again, next episode, I think maybe we do, maybe we do dive into some calibers, but if not, definitely bringing it back with some more Royal Oak references. We've got a lot to talk about there, a lot of calibers and complications, but oh, yeah. um, yeah, it was a fun episode. Is there anything you kind of wanted to go back and touch on or any, any other thoughts on like code 1159 or. I mean, again, I think code 1159 is a great investment piece. If you want an AP aftermarket, it's just, it's just hard to justify some of these, but I mean, if you want a perpetual calendar, I would buy a perpetual calendar aftermarket. Their star wheel is a crazy looking watch. Um, we didn't even talk about, um, that, that's something, if you're looking for something crazy, um, by AP, then I would I would definitely look at the 1159s up at that level. Watches like the Chronograph or you know just some of their basic ones that you can buy for thirty thousand probably aftermarket or thirty five thousand probably that Chronograph. Why not if you can find an aftermarket Royal Oak for thirty eight thousand? I'd be buying that before I'd buy a Chronograph aftermarket. <laughs> so I yeah. mean you know they're that the 1159 is great for their crazy perpetual calendars and dials. Um, if you want something a little bit more dressy and I mean, there are a lot of perpetual calendars and those chronographs that have like gold gilted, um, indices and things like that. So there's, there's definitely something out there for everybody, but you know, if you're looking at AP, everybody knows when AP is AP has Royal Oak. Yeah. You know, didn't we say watch analytics? They said that the Royal Oak jumbo, which is just plain Jane stainless steel is trading at like 78 K or something Probably. like that. <laughs> uh, current, yeah. Currently trading at. Um, 78.3, according to watch analytics, that's funny because it's ironically the same cost as the rose gold, but I was just going to say, you reminded me that I've seen some Royal Oaks like recently, like newer, Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've been new, but I've seen some newer model within the 2010s or newer. Yeah. Yeah. And probably even twenties that are in the $30,000 price range. Like, you know, it's starting with a three. Yeah, and that's pretty. That's pretty wild because that's what they're offering these things for at retail is thirty five k. So, I mean, yeah, like if you give me the choice, you could spend fifty k at retail on one of because you know I bet you if you walked into an AP store and you're like, oh my god, I really love your chronographs. Mm-hmm. I bet you could get one of those. I mean, they're probably not going to deny you dropping fifty k on a watch that until now a lot of you guys have probably never heard of, but. I mean, it's just wild to think that you could get into like a two-year-old Royal Oak yeah. for 30, 30 grand, 34 grand. How crazy is that? Hey, they well, they say millionaires are made in the tough times when they have their money saved up and start investing during the down economy. And yeah. uh, the same thing, w- great watch collections are built during the unsure times, <laughs> put it that way, because a lot of, I know, friends and families watches that they have that are worth so much now, they bought for $4,500. Yeah. The whole <laughs> bought $4,500 is worth 25000 now. You do know a lot of people like that. that and, bought and it's, it's just people that are smart and have money saved up and they can, you know, they yeah. get them, they get them at the right time. And, uh, you know, they always, everything they touch seems to turn to gold. So, you know, yeah, we can all do it. 
just don't it, don't buy in years like 2021 2022 unless you just absolutely have to have it because yeah, you're in, gonna end up getting burnt thing. yeah you're like, just gonna end up getting burnt Time, watches are the first thing they're a luxury piece they're the first thing to ebb and flow as the economy does and um you know i mean the economy is still chugging along right now but there's definitely some uncertainty which is making the uh which is making the watch market uncertain yeah for sure um yeah, and it's not always going to happen, but that's a great point. I mean, yeah, if if the AB Royal Oak that's a year old or two years old starts dipping below retail, you know, I think yeah, that's probably when people get to their Grail watch. You know, some folks like you mm-hmm. said, if you're uh, if you're a savvy little squirrel and you've been saving up your nuts, then yeah, go go cash in and get you like a twenty eight thousand dollar Royal Oak um, <laughs> that could be like you said in a few years it could double that. You know, it could be worth so much more because. I've heard so many of your stories, people, you know, that have bought, like you said, the $4,000, you know, Kermit or the, you know, the $5,000, you know, bluesy. And these watches are now yep. worth two, three, four X and the market's Crazy. down. So, yep. um, yeah, if you see that, um, don't be shocked. We've seen it over the last few months. So might be a and little don't, more attainable don't listen than you to think. the crazy sales guys that'll tell you that it'll never get back down to that price because it will at some point it might not be yeah. soon but it will i mean the same people selling houses the interest rates will never get back down to below four percent again they're already estimating they them to get back down the threes in the two years later are you kidding me yeah. the people there it'll never get back down to the twos i bet you in the next 20 years there's going to be a time it'll get down to two percent interest rates. same thing with watch values submariners will never be back down worth forty five hundred dollars again i bet you at some point they will be and it's going to be sooner than you expect so Mm -hmm. don't listen to the sleazy salesman that try to you know high pressure sell you into getting something that you might not be able to comfortably afford because at some point it'll yeah at some point it'll go back to where you want it just might have to wait a little patience never hurt nobody exactly that's david's ted talk thank you yeah (laughs) that's exactly right because uh yeah i mean these are luxury items like it is not an absolute if you were dropping 30k on something that in a month might be worth 20 if you can't stomach that, why in the hell are you even doing it? You know what I mean? Exactly. I mean, if you're like, if you're buying one of the, like, you know, yeah, just go about it smart. But, um, the point of that discussion I think was to, was definitely from my perspective to just say like, when I saw those newer ones available for that price, it was like so much closer to what I thought you could get into them for. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that the Nautilus is like that. We'll do some research, but, uh, at least this one, you know, I've seen some from, from trusted dealers. So, Well, buddy, that was a great talk. Um, Glad that we did this one. I know it had been uh, in the works for a month or so, so I'm glad that we knocked this one out. Let us know what you guys thought about the episode. Give us your feedback. Hit us up on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. DM us, comment, leave a message, leave a note. Tell us. Give us a rate. Five stars. Yeah, rating, review. All of those things are super helpful. But uh, yeah, reach out, say hello, send us in some watch picks. We like meeting all you guys and gals, uh, giving us follows and shout outs and comments and DMs and all that stuff. So we've met a lot of people over the last couple of weeks. So keep it coming. Everyone have a great week and we will be back. I think soon we are coming up on some Omega or possibly Breitling part twos, but we've got Christopher Ward watch on loan yep. right now. So we'll be doing Christopher Ward in the next month or two. Um, so some small stuff, some big stuff, some mid midsize stuff. Even thinking about a James Bond episode, possibly for Omega Part 2. That could be fun. So we've got some cool stuff coming your guys' way. 